Let us start with the peace chant. Om Bhadram Karne Bhe Shrinuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Stushtu Vagam Sastanu Bhihi Vyashema Deva Hitain Yadayahu Swastina Indro Vridha Shravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swasti nastarkshyo arishtanemihi Swasti nobrihaspatir dadhatu Om shanti 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 Last time we were studying in the Mandukya Karika, the second chapter, we had gone up to verse number 15. Right? If those who are following, 15, yes. What was going on is this. Um, Gaudapada is attempting to prove that our waking experiences are as unreal as our dream experiences. We all admit, universally admitted, that the dream experiences are not to be taken as being real. Now the waking experiences also are not real, uh, they are false and Gaurapada is using the dream, the example of the dreams to prove that. He is using logic based on experience to prove that. His strategy has been so far to show that no real difference, no significant difference can be shown between dreams and waking. Somebody said, no, no, dream objects are all in here. Um, whereas waking world, things are out there. Just as in the waking experience, we see that a book out here, we consider it to be real. And if I imagine this book in the mind, I don't consider it to be a real book. I don't say I have two books. I have only one book. I may imagine this in my mind, but that's not a second book. Similarly, using that logic, somebody said, um, dream experiences are like that. They are in the mind. There's nothing outside. Therefore, they're false. But ex external waking experiences are not like that. Waking experiences, the objects are external. That was the discussion last time. But Gaurapada, he gave in to a number of arguments. But finally, he said a simple refutation. In the dreams too, we experience objects both outside and inside. It's only when we wake up, we say, oh, the whole thing was inside. In the dreams, uh, where, when I uh, walk by the lake, I see the lake outside. I don't think that it is in my head. Uh, so, that's, so that difference does not hold. Um, similarly, somebody said the pragmatic argument, what is in the waking state, it works. Money in the waking state can buy you things in the grocery, uh, dog biting you in the waking state is going to hurt. But what is in the dream state does not work. It's not practically, it has no practical effect on your life. But again, you know the, ar the uh, argument, that's, that's only with respect to your waking state. It's when you wake up, you realize that those things are false and they have no effect whatsoever. But in the dream, as long as the dream lasts, this, they are seen to have an effect. If you are thirsty in the dream world, n even if you have a glass of water next to your bed and you have fallen asleep and you are dreaming and you are thirsty, it's only water in the dream which will satisfy your thirst in the dream, not the water by your bedside. So practical efficiency is not also an argument to differentiate between waking and dreaming. You can't say on the basis of practical efficacy that objects of the waking world, this is real, and dream worlds are not real. You cannot say that. Another argument was last one, the 15th one. Um, the experiences in the dream world are vague, whereas the experiences in the waking world are sharp and well-defined. Well, again, that is not true. It depends on the instrument of experience. If you use eyes and ears and experience a world out there, it is sharply defined. If you imagine the same thing in your mind, see a flower, and then imagine it in your mind, you will find that that one is clear and sharply defined and the one you imagine is not so uh, clear. It depends on the instrument you are using. Not only that, the same argument will also hold that when you dream, things in the dream, the external things seem sharply defined. You don't say, wait a minute, things are blurry, I must be dreaming. You never say that in your dream. You think it's normal, things are as they should be. So none of these show that 
And none of these can prove that the waking world is any way distinct from the dream world. But there was a third argument you had made that time, which was that even if we saw something in the waking world and we left that, like the room that we leave, yeah, that was the, the room still exists? Exactly. So that was the argument and that also did not hold. Okay. Remember? The, um, the waking, that was the same argument as the objects of the waking world are external to us and the objects in the dream world are internal. The internal objects therefore are not real and external objects are real. That was the argument. Um, that's what Shankaracharya Godapada used a technical term, the two timed, uh, something existed in two times and one exists only as long as you imagine it. But that argument is, it doesn't hold. In the dream world also you see things like that. Um, so, the, the conclusion that Gaurapada is, is driving towards is that all these things, experiences which we have, the differences between waking, dreaming, deep sleep, are because of the instruments that I, the conscious, consciousness, use. If I use a mind with eyes and ears and all of that, I will see an external world, I will hear sounds, I will come use the doorways of my senses to come in contact with an external world. If I shut down the, the sense organs and I dwell only in my mind, in a world of dreams or daydreaming, I will come only in contact with the, with the, uh, with the uh, constituents of my mind, what is there in the mind. If my mind also goes to sleep, I will see experience only blankness. These experiences, they all depend on me, the consciousness. So, Gaurapada uses two great arguments saying that that anything that is an object because it is an object it must be false it must be a dependent reality look at the uh, the boldness of this approach our very definition of truth the way we say speak i'm speaking the objective truth godapada would say by the very words it's false the moment you say object it must be false why should an object be false? Why should you say that and because it's an object it must be false? Be because yes, it depends on the experiencer. An object to whom? In our point of view, remember Gaurapada always, Advaita Vedanta always takes the experiencer's point of view. How you are experiencing the world. For you, all the objects that you experience depend on you, the experiencing consciousness. So, because a thing is an object, whatever you experience, because it's an object, it must be false. If you put it so baldly like that, it sounds, uh, uh, you know, uh, it sounds crazy. But this is the logic behind it. Remember, it's all this from the point of view of your experience. Whatever you experience, it must be an object and it depends on you, the experiencing consciousness. So in Sanskrit, Drishyatvad, because it's an object of experience, it must be false. False in what sense? A dependent reality. It has no independent reality apart from you, the experiencing consciousness. That is one argument. The second argument he uses is Anityatvad, because it is impermanent. Anything that comes and goes is born and dies, produced and destroyed, put together and falls apart, does not have intrinsic existence. Its existence depends on something else. Uh, its existence depends on something else. Like the dream world, the entire dream world, its existence depends on the mind of the dreamer. The moment you stop dreaming, the dream world falls apart. It's gone. Mm. Similarly, the argument is the waking world too depends on you, the consciousness. In fact, the dream world and the waking world both depend on me, the consciousness, on I, the consciousness. Um, I project, the mind falls asleep and because of this sleep, because of sleep, the world of dreams appears. Because of sleep, what happens? I forget the waking world, that I am safely in the bed um, sleeping, I forget that. And um, based on a forgetfulness of the waking world caused by sleep, the dream world appears. See what is the central what is the central condition for the dream world to exist? I must not be aware of the waking world. What is the waking world here? 
where you are asleep on, th on your, your bedroom on, on the bed. That you must forget. Otherwise, you cannot really dream. So, dream world is based on sleep. Mind goes to sleep and then you dream. Similarly, the waking world is based on an ignorance of my... Re another kind of sleep. It's called maya. Yeah, the Sanskrit words are interesting. Sleep, the word is nidra. And maya, one of the terms for maya is maha nidra, the great sleep. So the great sleep is where we forget our real nature. And that real nature alone is projected as the waking world. What we see around us, people and bodies and minds in the world. The two great reasons hold. It's an object and it is impermanent. Whatever is impermanent must be false. Whatever is an object must be false. If you don't like the word false, other words were used. Empirical reality, transactional reality, the lower truth. You can say from lower truth to higher truth. You do not know things as they are. So, now, if object, anything that is an object must be an appearance, then what is the truth? What is the truth? What is the absolute truth? If we can call it false or a relative reality, then what is the absolute reality? Here is the clue. An object is a relative reality. An object is false. Then the absolute reality cannot be an object. If there is something, something real ultimately which exists and it cannot be an object, what must it be? The subject, yes. You say it confidently. The subject. Vedanta is very simple. Ultimately, it's all talking about you, the subject, what you are really. So, the logic is this. If an object by its being an object is false, then the ultimate reality cannot be an object. The ultimate reality, the absolute reality, cannot be an object. Then apart from an object, what else is there? Apart from all objects, what else is there? The subject. The pure subject. What do you mean by pure subject? A subject which has taken lots of baths in the uh, holy river or something. No. Pure subject means a subject devoid of all objective entities. That means you the subject, but not you the body, not you the senses, not you the mind or the intellect. You the pure consciousness without the slightest tinge of objectivity or object. Uh, that pure subject, that alone is the ultimate reality. This is what Advaita Vedanta wants to say. That pure subject alone projects through Maya this world which seems to be a separate external objective world. Having projected this world, you alone, you the pure subject, you give it reality. Satta. Satta means existence. Giving it reality, you alone enter into this world as the waker and you experience it. Here it's going, I'm talking about what's going on right now. You, the pure consciousness, you have projected this world, given it existence. What do I mean given it existence? It borrows its existence from you. Example, like the dream borrows its existence from you, the dreamer. Everything in the dream, people and the sky and the earth and everything in the dream, whatever you see, it depends on you. Without you, the experience that the dream will disappear immediately. Similarly, Gaurapada says, everything in this objective world depends on the consciousness which has projected it. It depends for its existence on consciousness which has projected it. But remember, I don't mean here the consciousness of an individual person. I'm not saying you here right now, this person has, is imagining the entire world. You, you are a tiny creator in, in your own capacity. You can imagine a dream world. But in your real nature as pure consciousness, as the fourth, you project this external world. And you give it reality for the time being. And you enter into it as an individual and experience it. You project it, you give it reality, and you are the one who experiences it as this individual. Which individual? As the waker in your waker's world right now. As the dreamer in your dream world. As the deep sleeper in the darkness, blankness of deep sleep. So this pure consciousness, which is the very basis of the universe, I was just reading um, Sri Ramakrishna. He is telling Keshav Sain. Keshav Sain, you know, he was a well-known reformer, the Brahma Samaj in 19th century India. 
and he had traveled to England in those days, which was considered a great thing, and he had met the Queen. So that was the acme of climbing the social ladder in those days. And so um, Sri Ramakrishna is telling him, you have traveled to far lands and have seen so many things in, across the world. But have you not seen that which is the foundation of the world, that which upholds in Bengali Dharon Kara, that which upholds this world, which gives it existence? Have you not seen my mother? In Bengali, our Maake Dakhoni. You have seen so many things, but don't you see that which holds this world together, that which gives existence to this world? So, what he calls the mother, Upanishad calls the fourth, the real consciousness which you are, ultimately. Now, in every experience, there is the experiencer and the experienced. This world is your experienced world and you are the experiencer. You means the, you the waker now. In Sanskrit, Jiva and Jagat. Jiva means we, the sentient being. And Jagat means what we experience. Now a question may come, which is first? We are saying that that, that consciousness projected everything. So which one was projected first? Which comes first? The world comes first. Or you, the sentient being, comes first. There is, it's really, a, yeah, it's like a seed and tree or chicken and egg problem. There is no first, really, it's circular. But um, a provisional answer is that, uh, why provisional? Because ultimately none of these are real. Ultimately that pure consciousness alone is real. But if you insist on asking the question, which comes first? Vedanta would say, and the other Hindu philosophies also would say, you, the sentient being, you come first. It is for you that God or Ishwara creates this world. Why, f why for us? Now, you by, by you I mean the sentient being Jiva. Consciousness already uh, entered into this world as an individual being. So why is the world created for us? Because each of us, we have our karma, past karma, and we need to experience the results of our past karma. Now we are talking at the level of the empirical individual, which we are, we are used to our, looking at ourselves as. So we have our past karma, and that past karma has to give results. To experience the results of that past karma, we need a world. And Ishwara, or Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes, the creator god of religion, creates the, the universe to give us these results. So the why of the universe, why is this universe there? For you, for us. Who did this? I don't have the capacity of making a universe, nor did I order one. Mm -hmm. So, where did it come from? God gave it to us. Why? Why would he do such a thing? It's a good thing. We need the results of our past karma to go on evolving and learning. Remember, now we are talking at an empirical level, not at the level of the absolute reality now. You might ask, where did all this past karma come from? Well, from our previous births where we um, did a lot of actions, good and bad, and that leads to good and bad karma. And according to that, we get our present birth and the future births. And so it goes. Your question might be, how did it start first? And there's the problem. You cannot have, <laughs> how did it start first? It's a cyclical problem. Um, science, materialist science would say, no, 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 no. The world was created first, the universe was created first in a big bang and billions of years later the planet cooled, this planet at least cooled enough for um, complex matter to come and then it evolved into living matter, life came about somehow and that evolved through evolution into more and more complex forms till it formed nervous systems and brains and those nervous systems and brains somehow have generated the mind and consciousness which you call yourself, the person. So the individual being comes much, much later, is a product of some accidental processes in this universe. If you ask then why, if you ask science, because why has a very good answer in, in Vedanta or any religion. Why is, why is this there? For you. And each religion will give its own spin on why or what is the story. Vedanta will say karma, through a theory of karma. But science, suppose you ask science, why? What do you think the answer is? There is no answer. Why is not a question in science? It's accidental, just like that. Just like that, yes, just like that, that's all. Isn't it so? That's what science says. When it, can, science talks about the how it could have happened. It, there is really no why. Why is a question that human beings generate? 
a meaning or purpose, it's not a scientific question. There is no meaning or no purpose. So take your pick. <laughs> take your pick. Um, Vedanta says there is a meaning and purpose. Why is there a meaning and purpose? Or how is there a meaning and purpose? So these arguments are all borrowed from the ancient philosophy of Sankhya. They give a very interesting argument. Just for the sake of argument, I'm telling you this. Um, the term they use is Sanghata Parathatvat. Anything that is put together, a complex entity, is always meant for something outside that complex entity. What, the, what does it mean? House, a complex entity like the house, the doors and walls and the fixtures, they are not meant for each other. The doors and walls are not meant for each other, the fixtures are not, the fan is not meant for the light, the light is not meant for... No, the whole thing is meant for you, the person sitting here, and you are not part of this complex. You are something from outside this complex. You come in and it is for you this thing has been put together. And uh, so, another example they gave, very cute example of the bed. So when you put a bed together, there's a bed, there are bed sheets and there's a comforter and there are pillows and the bedstead. Now, it is not that the pillows are meant for the sheets and the comforter is meant for the bedstead. No, the whole assembly is meant for somebody other than the bed who is going to come and use it. So, all things which are put together are not put together for, e for, uh, for the objects themselves. They are meant for something apart from those objects. What's the point of these arguments? In this entire universe, the argument is that the entire universe, which is a very complex universe, the whole thing, material universe, is meant for something which is not part of the material universe, which is, we call it the spirit or consciousness or whatever. You will say this is not a proof. Yeah, it's not a proof. It's an argument. It's like a lawyer would argue in a court. So it's a, like a persuasive argument. Yes. For us, for the sentient being, yes, for you the consciousness, body-mind is put together. First of all, mind is the sentient being itself. That is what survives death, which came before death and after that also it will survive. The physical body falls apart. Another physical body will be given. Based on what? Is it random? No. It's based on your karma, the karma of the jiva. What is the jiva? It is that pure consciousness limited by a mind, by a subtle body. Or to be more technical, by a causal body and a subtle body. Jiva is with the physical body and Jivatma, Jiva is the physical body with the... Jiva, is, Jiva or Jivatma is that uh, subtle uh, consciousness limited by causal body and uh, subtle body. And it keeps on getting different physical bodies. Jiva and Jivatma are same. Are same thing, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so this you said everything is for you, is that as per Samkhya, Purusha and... <laughs> Sankh, Purusha and Prakriti. So the Prakriti's activities are for Purusha. Okay. Yes. So you are the Purusha. Purusha here does not mean male or female. Prakriti or Purusha. It means nature and consciousness. So you are consciousness. And nature provides you with everything. Body, mind and an external universe. That's a Sankhya idea. Here the Vedanta idea is God uses nature to provide you with all of this. But the central idea is the same. So first you, then the universe. This is the this is what Godapada is going to say now. Let's see. How does this work? Let's see. Sixteen. Jivam kalpayate purvam. Jivam kalpayate purvam. Tato bhavan prithagvidhan. Tato bhavan prithagvidhan. Bahyan adhyatmikang shaiva. Bahyan adhyatmikang shaiva. Yatha vidyas tatha smritihi. Yatha vidyas tatha smritihi. First, he. He here means God. What is God? The third. Remember the consciousness, four aspects. First aspect is consciousness in its physical or gross aspect with a physical body. And the second one is consciousness in the subtle aspect, is consciousness with the mind only. Third one is consciousness in its causal aspect, consciousness with ajnana, with ignorance only, deep sleep. There in the third aspect, if you take the cosmic, the totality, consciousness plus maya, 
This is what is meant by he. Here he means God. He imagines the individual soul first and then the universe. Notice the operative word, imagines. He doesn't say create. For Gaudapada, the question is moot. Who comes first? His real answer would be nothing comes first. Only, only Brahman exists. But since we need an explanation, so the approach, in fact, not only Vedanta, in all religion, the conscious element will be stressed more than the material element, always. So, Gaurapada says that Brahman, with, with qualities, God, imagines the jiva first, doesn't even create, imagines the jiva first, and then the, then the universe. Bhavan Prithagvidhan. The Prithagvidhan means the multifarious universe of millions and billions of entities, stars and planets and particles and so on and so forth. What kinds of entities does God imagine? Bahyan Adhyatmikang Chaiva. External, what you see right now, the physical world, and internal, the subtle world, mind, intellect, thoughts, uh, memories, all of that. The internal world and the external world. Both are projected by God, imagined by God, given existence by God, and experienced by God alone as a jiva. As what did I say? That consciousness alone projects the universe, gives existence to the things in the universe, and experiences the universe also as a jiva. It's not difficult to understand exactly what you do in dreams. You project the entire dream world, give existence to it. Existence means as long as the dream lasts. And you yourself experience good and bad dreams by being a part of the drama. Right. So yes. When Vedanta talks about universe, yes. it's not just the planet Earth, it's the whole... It's the whole universe. And not only that, not just the physical universe, also the mental universe. That means all minds, life, mind, mind includes intellect, mind, memories, emotions, uh, not only individual, everybody's mind, all thoughts, everything. Um, so, all of that is the universe. So, the eternal truth is, applies to the whole? Uh, the whole universe. The whole. Absolutely. Yes, yes. It talks about the whole universe. It talks about multiplicity of worlds. Many worlds. They did not have exactly the way, modern cosmological idea of many galaxies and so on and so forth. But they talked about different kinds of worlds. One is, they talk about this physical universe, which is so vast. But they talk about 14 uh, universes or 14 locus, of which one only is this what we call the physical universe. So, so but all of them are projections of, of God, of a Brahman, Brahman with Maya. First projected us and then the universe, yes. Uh, so this concept of Saguna Brahmana, yes. another version you just said is the cosmic mind. Yes. Aggregation of all minds. All minds, yes. Consciousness plus all minds. But then, since our minds are impure, yes. the cosmic mind is also impure. Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, the cos cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha, has an existence apart from just our individual minds also. It's not just a collective. Just as I am something more than a collection of my cells. The collection of my cells, I am identified with all of them, but they, their limited capacities put together is I know. I am something much more than that also. So, Ishwara and uh, Hiranyagarbha, they are, um, they have a predominance of Sattva. The idea is that they have a predominance of Sattva in them. Uh, that's why they are forever enlightened, for example. Extraordinarily knowledgeable, extraordinarily powerful. It's like, the example they give, uh, interesting example, the poison in the, in the glands of a, of a snake, little bit of that is enough to kill a frog or, um, um, uh, or a mouse, right? But all of that poison is in the glands of the, of the snake, it doesn't do anything to the snake, rather it is the power of the snake. Similarly, all of our limitations, at the individual level, what is a limitation, at the Collective level, at the level of Ishwara, that becomes the power. That becomes the power. This is the example given by Sri Ramakrishna. All the poison, the poison is not a weakness for the snake. It is, uh, the one on which it acts is terrible. We are trapped in samsara. But the one who wields this power. So at the level of Ishwara, 
Ishwar is always free, Saguna Brahman. At the level of Hiranyagarbha, still always free. And at the level of Virat, the physical universe, always powerful and always free. Yes. Um, when I dream, it's almost like I, I have my memories preloaded as soon as the dream starts. Or yes. I remember that, oh, I just came into existence. Hmm. And I can theoretically remember the whole lifetime. I yes. So when the Ishwar in this case imagines the Jiva, Yes. Does he also preload some kind of a history or there is the beginning of the universe? No. The, we are uh, beginningless. The, how, when did Ishwara first start? Beginningless. Why? Why is it beginningless? Maya. The Maya of Ishwara. It's because of Maya this universe is projected and we are also projected. Now is Maya, when did Maya begin? It, it's beginningless because Maya is beyond time. Time is within Maya. So Maya is beyond time and the projections of Maya are also beginningless. So the jiva has no beginning and no particular end also. But the thing is it's a projection. The moment you realize it's a projection, you're free from it. You always were free from it. You are the, you are the screen on which the projection is going on. Yeah. So it's beginningless, but it's not real. That's the interesting thing. Yes. Swami, does Gaudapada have any use or does he give any value to the theory of karma and maybe the formation of existence? Oh, it's going to come now, right now. <laughs> this is where we are. Yes, uh, every Vedantic theory will give some uh, value to karma. But remember, ultimately even karma will be shown to be an appearance only. Karma is something that we, Vedanta uses to explain this universe. To explain the order in this universe, give explanations of why this is happening, not that. Why do I have this particular parents, this body, why am I having these experiences? They will say, your past karma. But I didn't do anything. No, you didn't have to. According to your past karma, you just did your past karma and according to your past karma, God gives you this experience. This is the explanation. And Gaudapada says this. But remember, all this is at what level? Not the absolute reality. At the level of transactional reality. In Sanskrit, Vyavaharika. Here it comes. How karma works. See. This verse itself. So what does he say? First, he projects the jiva and then this multifarious universe. Consisting of external things and internal things. The operative word is as knowledge and as memory. So what does that mean? This is where karma comes into play. As the jiva has various experiences, what experiences? Karma, past karma, uh, consisting of good and bad karma, gives rise to various experiences. Sukha and dukkha. Sukha means happiness, dukkha means misery. These experiences and now leave impressions on our minds. What kind of impressions? In Sanskrit they are called Raga Dvesha. Raga means attraction. Dvesha means aversion. We have the nature of um, this. This is pleasant. I want more of this. This is unpleasant. I want to avoid it. Now with this Raga Dvesha we react to the external world and we act. We do things. And those actions are either uh, dharma or adharma. Dharma means moral, desirable, ethical. Adharma means immoral. And that dharma or adharma produces what is called papa or punya. Punya means merit. Papa means demerit. So dharma produces punya. And Adharma produces Papa. Papa is literally, you can translate it as sin or demerit. And, yes, could you help him? Yes. And this Papa Punya will again give rise to a new birth, rebirth. This, this Papa Punya is basically our karma. And that gives rise to new rebirth. And in that rebirth, we will have many experiences. 
and those experiences will be pleasant or unpleasant. Depending on our past conditioning, we will react to it as Raga Dvesha, I want, I do not want. And then we, we perform some action that gives rise to further dharma or adharma, papa or punya, and the cycle continues. Basically, this is the law of karma. This is the cycle of karma. This is what he means by the terms yatha vidyas yatha, uh, yatha smritihi. He uses the terms yatha vidya as is experienced. Vidya literally means knowledge. As is your knowledge of the world or experience of the world. Tatha smritihi. So is your conditioning in the mind. So this, as we experience the world and getting various pleasant and unpleasant experiences, depending on our past conditioning, the Raga Dvesha, we act. And in doing an action, we, it is either ethical action according to uh, ethics and dharma, which leads to merit, good, good karma, what we call good karma, and that good karma will give rise to more sukha, happiness in future lives. If we, if we cannot propelled by our uh, conditioning, if we cannot restrict ourselves within the limits of um, dharma and we do adharma, unethical action, that leads to papa, demerit, and that can produce dukkha, suffering in future lives. And so the cycle continues. Yes, hold on to the question. So this is basically Gaudapada's answer. Remember the question which was asked, which is first, which is prior? The answer is it's cyclical. And if you have to have something prior, it is the jiva which is propelling the universe by its own actions. How? This way. Yeah. This way. By experiencing, getting conditioned, reacting based, in, based on that conditions and generating karma again and again and being born again and again. So this cycle continues. Yes. And how do you get off the wheel of karma? Ah, you come to class. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get off the wheel of karma? It's going to come next. But basically, remember what was said, what's being said according to non-dual Vedanta. There are um, Hinduism has a whole range of answers to that. That's what the shop is there for. If you want a solution to your karma problems, come to the, the, the karma shop. So, yes. How do you uh, get off this wheel of karma? If you are of a devotional persuasion, the dualistic Vedanta, they will say by the grace of God. You can't do it on your own. All dualistic religions offer some variation on this. Christianity, now you can understand the whole, uh, the inner working of that. That uh, the evil that we are under, if you put it in Christian terms, evil that we are under, there's nothing that we can do to really overcome it. So it's God's grace expressed as the Son, as Jesus Christ, and as the sacrifice of the Son on the cross, which pays for our karma. I'm using Vedantic terms, and sets us free. That would be a, uh, a, a Christian interpretation. Basically, the dualistic devotional interpretation in Hinduism is almost similar. It is by the grace of God alone that you are freed from karma. So what you need is, therefore, devotion to God and surrender to God. The, the non-dualistic answer, the answer you get in these Upanishads, is that no, 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 not that way. Remember, the whole problem is one of ignorance. How are you freed from your dream? Waking By waking up. If the whole thing is a dream, and if you do good karma in your dream, and your dreams become progressively um, nice dreams, and if you do bad karma in your dreams, and your dreams become um, uh, degenerate into nightmares, now one solution would be to try to keep doing good karma in the dreams and getting good dreams or avoiding bad karma and avoiding nightmares. But that's not really a solution. The solution is waking up from the dream. And so non-dual Vedanta says, you must wake up to the reality. The reality is this, that they are all projections of Maya. The reality is, is you the pure consciousness. And that reality, you have to wake up. How do you wake up? Dream to waking up, how do you wake up? Alarm clock. It will ring. And what is the alarm clock here? The alarm clock here is Vedanta, which, which <laughs> tells you what you are. <laughs> yes. You keep, keep focusing on that till it strikes, till you break through. That, oh, I see. This is what's going on. And in that case, 
what you wake up to is an immortal consciousness. Hence, you are free of birth and death. That pure consciousness is not born, nor does it die. It, it is not a body. Hence, you are free of aging and disease. It is not a mind. Hence, you are free of lust and greed and frustration and anger uh, and desire. You are free of all limitations when you realize yourself as the absolute consciousness. Give your hands up. I'll come to you. Mm. you. Mm. Uh, what does he mean when he says yatha vidya? Yatha vidya, tatha smriti. This is what I just said. So yatha vidya means as is experienced. Vidya means knowledge. What, what, in what sense does he mean vidya here? As you experience the world. Look at this link. Janati knows. Then smarati remembers. Remembers the past conditioning. This is nice. I want this. Then next, Ichati desires. I would like to have some of this. Then next, Yatate makes an effort. Does something in the world. The moment you do something in the world, consequences will be generated. And those consequences, that is called karma. Dharma and adharma, that goes to your stock of karma. Generating future births. So yes. This is the yes, for us. Right now, what we consider ourselves. That was the question. Who is first? This world or me? That was the question. In a dream, for example, who is first? The dream world or that person in the dream? You will say, but both come up simultaneously, right? It's actually cyclical. They, they depend on each other. But if you are forced to give an answer, you would say the dream, the person in the dream is primary. It's for that person, the world is created. Yes. Swamiji, I'm still stuck in karma. Hmm. I, jiva is uh, how does jiva attach to the actions and how does it carry from lifetime to lifetime, to lifetime, to lifetime. right so this uh, I will quickly touch upon it but remember this is not the subject here um, Godapad is not really interested in this because after all the whole thing the universe and the karma and the jiva they are all projections they are not real what is real is that fourth Turiya now but for the sake of um, filling out the details in the theory. So any action that we do, the law of karma or theory of karma says, any action that we do has three effects. Two of them are well known and beyond any, any argument. What are the two? One is the effect which is a physical effect. You, do, you give food or medicine to somebody and that per per person benefits. You see that. You see that. That happens. You do something in the world, any action has a, re has a, a reaction and effect. That's first effect. The second effect is little subtle on our minds. Keep helping somebody and your mind gets the tendency to help you become a sharing person, a better person. So our actions have effects on our own minds. That's the psychological effect of karma. It changes us. The third one, which is where a little bit of it comes in here. It's called the cosmological effect. Um, which is, if it's dharma, it gives rise to something called merit in Sanskrit, um, punya. It's a common word in India. Uh, if it's adharma, consciously overstepping the norms of morality and ethics, it gives rise to something called demerit, papa. Now the effect, and this is called our the karma phala. And this is stored, um, now how is it transmitted? First of all, this, this is stored in a cosmic sense with God, in, in Maya. And its results are given to us in the world that we are born into, in our, what kind of parents you're going to have, what kind of good or bad experiences you will have in life and so on. The psychological effects of karma are stored in our minds, technically in the sukshma sharira, chitta. That does not die with the death of the body. With the physical death of the body, the sukshma sharira transmigrates, janmantara. It goes into newer and newer births. So as we evolve, our subtle body gets many, many layers of um, karma, results of karma, conditioning. That is what is called Yatha Smritaha. You asked what Yatha Vidya? Vidya means as is experienced. Yatha Smritaha is as is preconditioned. In that way, we keep doing karma and generating future karma. Yes. Not perfect, never can, only thing perfect is Brahman. Nothing is perfect in the world of manifestation. It's all under the limitation of time, space and causation. Yes, Gita itself says, 
all beginnings, all karma, sarvarambha doshai avrita, like a flame covered in smoke. Every karma is covered in uh, demerit. There will be something good, something bad. Generally, a moral effort gives you good karma. There will be some secondary bad karma associated with it. An immoral effort gives you a lot of bad karma. Might have some good karma uh, involuntarily associated with it. Yes. Yes. But now you feel stuck here. You have experienced your pure consciousness, but you feel like you are yes. present in your body. Right. Now, you have exp- <laughs> look at the language you used. Here, you need to settle down in, into, into what, you, what you just what you said. That I, suppose somebody has experienced the pure consciousness. And then you feel stuck here. You are stuck in the body. You have experienced pure consciousness as what? Oh, I experienced something as pure consciousness. No, no, no. I experienced that I am pure consciousness, right? Pure consciousness, as we are talking about it, it's not an object. It cannot be an object. It must be you. It's you, right. Step one. I am that pure consciousness. Now, next you said, but after that I see I'm stuck in the body. Who is saying that? Is pure consciousness stuck in the body? Even the mind is not stuck in the body. When you fall asleep, you are in a dream world, has no reference to this body at all. When you go into deep sleep, no reference to the universe at all. Neither waking universe nor dream universe. So even the mind is not stuck to the body. And one day this body will fall apart, it will die. The mind is free to travel onwards uh, to other bodies. So the mind is not stuck to the body. And you, the pure consciousness, you are not stuck to the mind also. When you realize yourself as a pure consciousness, So what you need to do is, when these objections come up, when you begin to get a clarity about what Vedanta is teaching, then these objections will come up. It's very natural. The mind will say, so what? Here I, we are still here, we are. You, pure consciousness and me, the mind, we are still stuck in the same situation. Who is saying that? Who is stuck here? It's like saying, the ornament says, I realize I am gold. The necklace says I am gold, but I'm still stuck to the necklace. No, the necklace is stuck to you. Necklace depends on you, you the goal for existence. Without gold, necklace does not exist. If you realize, I am not the person in the dream, suppose you realize, I am not the person in the dream. The whole dream is being imagined by me, I am safe and sound sleeping on my bed. After that, you cannot say I am stuck in the dream, even if the dream continues. Because you know the whole thing is me. It's, it's I alone. Yes. Yes. And then you know your inner dream. Yes. You're, you're dreaming, you're fully conscious that you are in a dream. Yes. But then it's still difficult to get out of the dream. Why, why would you get out? What would you get out of? Out of the dream? Because we have a waking state apart from the dream. You would want the dream to end and come into a waking state. Yeah. Here, you are the pure consciousness anyway. Whatever you dream. It could be a waking dream, it could be a dreaming dream, or it could be deep sleep, blankness of anything. All of them are nothing but you, the pure consciousness. And nothing there can hurt you. It becomes entertainment to you. What can hurt pure consciousness? Can old age hurt pure consciousness? Can pure consciousness be lonely? Can pure consciousness have lots of uh, financial debt? Can pure consciousness be sick? Abandoned? No. All of those things, even the nastiest things, they depend on pure consciousness for their very existence and experience. But you're still stuck until your physical body dies. You are stuck to what? What you're saying is, let this experience cease. Why? It will cease. It will cease when you fall asleep. It will cease in samadhi when you go into deep, deep meditation and it will cease when the physical body dies. Till that point, let it continue. What's the problem? If you are stuck in it as we are in ignorance, like being stuck in a nightmare, then it's a problem. It's suffering and it's real. But if I understand that it's a nightmare, if I understand that it's a horror movie, then I enjoy people pay good money to go and see horror movies. <laughs> So what you, must, uh, what, what you must do there is, 
strengthen the sense of what it is to be pure consciousness, then this, this horror story, it will weaken, it will loosen its grip upon you. I understand what you mean perfectly. It's good. But you strengthen the sense, I am Brahman. I am the witness of the misery which has come. It has come before that I was. When it is, I am. When it will go, I will still be there. It is there because of me. I give it existence. Now I am running away from it. But I give it existence. It is nothing without me. Suppose I am unconscious. Unconscious means my mind is switched off. Deep sleep, anesthesia, something. Where, are the, where is the waking world? Where is the worst misery of the waking world? Practically, fall asleep. Suppose I never wake up from that sleep. Whatever happens later will happen. I never wake up to this body and this life again. Am I stuck to it? No. You'll see, you have escaped from it. But not only have you escaped from it, when you are in it also, you are not stuck to it. If you are stuck to it, it would have held on to you, pulled you back again. It can't hold on to you. You are forever free of it. Right now also you are free of it. The worst nightmare depends on you. You don't depend on it. You are free of it. It shines in your light and it scares you. It says, boo, ha ha Halloween. When you know it's Halloween, you enjoy it. it it's, it's, a, it's the glory of you, the consciousness, which comes as heaven and hell before you. All right, I'll come to you. The person there is asking a question. Yes. Who exactly get liberation? Ah. <laughs> we will see later in this verse, it, later in this chapter, it will, it will come. Nanirodho um, na chutpatti. Your question and his question, we can put it together. Later in this verse, it will come. I have given a talk about this also. Uh, it is called? No, before that. The talk was the essence of all Vedanta. Uh, you will see. There is a verse which is going to come in this chapter. Um, I think it is verse number... Um, later on we will do it. It is one of the most profound verses. 32. Verse number 32. That is an answer to your question. You know what he says? Na nirodho na cha utpatti, na baddho na cha sadhaka, na mumukshur na vai mukta, ittesha paramarthata. This is the absolute truth. What is the absolute truth according to Advaita Vedanta? Na nirodho na cha utpatti. There is no cessation of this universe. Why? Because there never is a universe. So you know, I am stuck in this. No, you are not. You're, this thing does not exist itself. What are you stuck in? But it was created. This is no utpatti. It was never created. But then we are trapped. You just said mukti, freedom. We are in, in, in bondage. That's, what, that's why we are here in the class. We are in bondage. Na badda. Nobody is in bondage. But then we are trying. To get out of bondage, what about all those spiritual seekers all over the world, throughout the history of the universe, uh, of, of uh, civilization, you are trying to get liberated? Nacha sadhaka, nobody is a spiritual seeker. <laughs> <laughs> but then what about those who, who want liberation? You, you are doing spiritual uh, sadhana, spiritual practice because you want liberation. Namu mukshu, nobody wants liberation. There is nobody, uh, there is nobody who wants liberation. But then at least the enlightened persons, Shankara, Gaurapada, Ramakrishna, Namukta, there is no enlightened person. What do you mean? Ittyesha Paramarthata, this is the absolute truth. <laughs> no, there is you. <laughs> yes, yes. Brahman alone exists. So, that's the ultimate answer. Now, if you say that's too much, I can't digest that. <laughs> Give me something halfway between. You are saying who gets liberated? The jiva gets liberated. So what is the difference between jiva and brahman? No difference. <laughs> <laughs> Your next question will be, so that means I the jiva, I am brahman. So does brahman get liberated? No. If you already know that you are brahman, you wouldn't even ask this question. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't feel like it's, it's a paradox. And the paradox is a sign of maya. If you inquire far enough, this is an important thing. If you inquire far enough, you will discover fault lines in this whole structure, which shows you this structure is false. It's not consistent. If you push far enough, 
So the thing is this whole structure has been put forward as a way of teaching to set you free from the delusion that you are trapped. See, he says, if anybody was actually in bondage, they could be set free. But nobody is in bondage. How will you set them free? You have to realize that you are free. Exactly. You are free. right? Again and again, Gaudapada is saying, Advaita is saying, you are free right now. You are Brahman right now. You always were, you always will be. This delusion of, you know, that I am not free. It seems obvious that I am, I am, I am sick, I am old, I am diseased, I am un, uh, unfulfilled. Vedanta will show you that no, none of them are true. What you really are, it can never be diseased, never be old, never be unfulfilled. No. So this kind of questioning is very interesting. It comes up again and again in Vedantic literature. What you just asked. If your thinking is on the right track, this question has to come. What you just asked. In the Gita Bhashya, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, at one place in 13th chapter, Shankara is going on about this and the opponent, somebody asks a question. Then uh, who is it... Um, uh -huh. Same question, uh, who, who says, um, who is it that is in ignorance? You're saying that I am Brahman. Is Brahman in ignorance? Is the sun in darkness? Who is it that is in ignorance? And you know what Shankara's answer, very interesting. At that place, Shankara's answer is, why do you ask? And then he says, because I don't know. Then you are in ignorance. <laughs> you just said, I don't know. The, mo the moment you say, I don't know, that is ignorance. You're admitting that I am in ignorance. The, no, it's not being clever. If you, see, if ignorance were a real thing, if bondage were a real thing, then it could be defined and taken care of. And then in that case, knowledge would not work. What does knowledge do actually? It, it can only do one thing. It can remove ignorance. Yeah. It can't take you anywhere. It can't change anything. It can only remove ignorance. Every, according to Vedanta, everything is perfect as it is right now. Everything means Brahman is perfect as it is right now. Our ignorance distorts. And we think we are body, mind and this is a huge problem to be solved. And Vedanta step by step solves it. Hold on, hold on to your horses. <laughs> let's, let's go ahead a little further. So this is the answer to the question which is first. Jiva or Jagat, me or the universe? So you are first in order of importance. Because of you, the universe is done. By whom? By God. All right, do ask. There's no why, no. The Jiva. Or in, in Vedantic perspective, the world was projected. Jiva was projected, world was projected, Jiva projected first. But yes. For the purpose of... The Jiva, the world is uh, imagined or projected, yes. It's similar to sort of the Christian idea of intelligent design, sort of. Sort of, yes. But if you look at this universe, there is so much wastage. Hmm. You have planets and galaxies that serve no purpose for the Jiva. That doesn't... I know, it, it violates your sense of economy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, you're walking uh, there uh, uh, in Manhattan and uh, you're going to have uh, uh, um, maybe a coffee in a shop. and you, The whole thing is in your dream. And now when you wake up and you say, oh, if the whole purpose was to have a cup of coffee in a shop, why imagine the whole of Manhattan? So much wastage is there. Could just imagine Starbucks and a cup of coffee. No, the entire universe comes along with Starbucks. Uh -huh. The whole universe is there. But the thing is, there's no wastage. Where is the wastage? But this jiva, there is, is the jiva this individual in a human body? Or, or Not only human body, it can be in any body. This jiva and jiva is ultimately none other than Brahman who is imagining. This. Nothing is lost, nothing is wasted. Because ultimately it is all Brahman and it is you. So we, we do accept that in, when the world was created. Never created, imagined. Yes. The human aspect was not there. It started from a very singular, cellular structure. Mm, no. no, no, no. The human aspect, the conscious aspect was there. Sentient being was there. 
See, the Hindu idea of creation and destruction is this. From the unmanifest comes the manifest. From the abhyakta comes the vyakta. Like in your, from your deep sleep comes your dream and waking. And it goes back to deep sleep. If you look at it that way. So Ishwar alone, alone with Maya remains in the, when there is no universe. And from Maya, just like from deep sleep, waking and dreaming emerge, this universe emerges. That is called creation within quotes. And then after countless billions of years, it again goes back into Maya, like going back into deep sleep. But none of it is actually created or destroyed. The only thing that changes is projection and withdrawal. And all throughout, the only thing that exists is Brahman. It's because of Maya, this cycle of dreaming goes on. In this dreaming, Brahman alone enters into all of this as billions of jivas. And plays the role of lifetimes after lifetimes. And then finally gets liberation. Attains to itself. You call it a play, call it a movie show, whatever you call it. And from Gaudapada's point of view, nothing has ever happened. It's all perfect, Brahman. It, it's like, suppose a movie. All these terrible things that Harry Potter had to go through. What? Um, seven books and so many things. Tragedies and uh, struggles and his father and mother dying and things like that. And villains and uh, horrible um, you know, uh, ups and downs. Such an innocent little boy. Why did he have to go through all this? Godapada will say, none of it happened. And he would be right. It's a movie. What is real is the screen and light. From the point of view of the screen and light, there is no Harry Potter, there is no um, magic school, there is nothing. And in the story there is everything. So this idea of levels of reality. Okay, let me just go ahead. I have to, today's plan is to finish the next two verses. Because connected with this, this one dealt with the question, who is first, you or the universe? And Gaurapada says, in line with any kind of religion, that the sentient being is first. It is for you that the universe exists. But from the materialistic reductionist point of view, from a scientific perspective, it's just the opposite. The universe exists and you are an accident, an afterthought. Even thought is an afterthought. <laughs> the universe could have just as well existed without any life and, many, and any kind of... Uh, so that's the scientific perspective. The, um, any kind of religious perspective will put you first. Um, the real thing is, according to Vedanta, it is, if you look at the karma theory, it's a cycle. There is no beginning and no end. In a circle you can't say where it begins and where it ends. And you go further back into Advaita, none of this is a real question. Because it's all an appearance. Now the next question comes, oh, so if Jiva is the source of all of this, how is the Jiva or why is the Jiva at all projected? Ultimately if I, the sentient being, I am doing karma and my karma is re responsible for God giving me this life, and I go on from life after life and I strive to realize that I am Brahman and I realize I am Brahman and I get freedom. Finally I am Brahman, then why was I there in the first place at all? How was I, the Jiva, created and why? This question will come. If you are with the question, then the answer will make sense. Here is the answer. You already know the answer. You are not created. <laughs> the 17th verse. Now the question is, why this jiva was created? Alright, jiva is primary, let us say. But why then, why jiva at all? 17th verse. Anish cheta yatha rajju Anish cheta yatha rajju Andhakade vikalpita Andhakade vikalpita Sarpadhara dibhir bhavai Sarpadhara dibhir bhavai Tadvad Atma Vikalpitaha Tadvad Atma Vikalpitaha A beautiful verse. He brings forward the, the classic example of sn uh, and, uh, s snake and rope. Snake and rope, which is uh, so common in Advaita. What is the answer? Why is the jiva there at all? If that is the crux of the whole game. The answer is, just as a rope whose nature as a rope has not been determined, is not clear. Maybe it is in semi-darkness. You know there is something. But you don't know what it is. Something straight and like a thin thing lying there. You don't know what it is. You don't know it's a rope. Not knowing it's a rope, then it is mistaken. Error creeps in. 
and error is multiple. So he says, Sarpadharadi bir bhave. The er entity is born of error. Bhava is the entity is born of error. Somebody says, Oh, it's a snake. Be careful. Somebody says, No, it's a stick on the ground. Maybe from, from a twig from the tree has fallen down. Somebody says, No, it's a mala. Mala means a garland discarded from the temple. So these could be typical alternatives. Say, imagine a dark village road in India, for example. It could be a snake. It could be a twig from a tree. It could be a temp um, garland discarded from the temple. It's there. None of them are real. The rope is not, the snake is not real, the twig is not real, the garland is not real. All of them are vikalpa, error. And where, how are they born, if you ask? Why are they born? The why and the how, they all depend on ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of the rope as a rope. Here is something subtle, not total ignorance. In total darkness, you wouldn't see anything. You wouldn't see a rope also, you wouldn't see a snake also. It's in semi-darkness. You see something, that something part of it is right. There is something. The rest of it is false. Whether you call it a snake or a, a twig or a garland, it's false. Similarly, here in this universe, when pure consciousness, Turiya, the reality, is not appreciated for what it is, that I am this existence consciousness bliss, then in this ignorance, a part of reality is still appreciated. It is, isness, awareness. These things are there. But then the rest of it is names and forms. Multiplicity. That one non-dual consciousness is now imagined, projected as a universe of duality, of plurality. Of billions of galaxies and particles and people and um, external universe and internal world of thoughts and feelings and emotions. All of these are nothing but that one, not the rope, pure consciousness. So this is what he says. Just as a rope whose nature has not been well ascertained is imagined in the dark to be various things like a snake, a line of water, etc. So also is the self imagined variously. Self means capital S, pure consciousness. That is projected. Mind, body, world, people, things to be done. Um, life, projects in life, all of them are nothing but that pure consciousness. Yes? I mean, this is, in some way it's very hard to believe or fathom. Because it is saying everything we know yes. is basically ignorance. Is ba is we think we know. Yes, is born of ignorance, yes. What we know of science, what we know of the progress that science has made over the centuries, yes. what we know of the arts, what we know of logic, Yes. The logic is, is basically a construct. Yes. Okay? Yes. What we know of mathematical identities. Yes. Everything is ignorance. Our it, ignorance. It's it, a projection. It is born of projection. But remember, it does not deny that at the level at which mathematics functions, logic functions, or science r talks about, it's not saying that, for example, they will not say, oh, you have come up upon evolution through um, uh, considering evidence, and Darwin has theorized on evolution, but because of fundamental ignorance, you don't know it is Satchidananda, therefore the theory of evolution is wrong. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say the theory of relativity is wrong. What it those... Doesn't I mean, it doesn't say that, because, like because what they apply to... Because all these things are projections, they are not real. It is true, they are not real apart from the, the ground, their ground that is Satchidananda. But, at the empirical level at which they claim to apply, they apply. Will 2 plus 2 give you 4 or not? Before Vedanta and after Vedanta? Of course it will. <coughs> make two levels. At the level of pure consciousness. It is true that only pure consciousness exists. At the level at, of the projection of the movie. It's true that everything, that uh, Harry Potter is there and the school of magic is there and the whole plot line is there. In the movie, if somebody told you, it's only a screen and light. And if Harry Potter goes around searching for where is the screen and light, he'll never find it. Because he's at the level of the movie. But behind him, underneath the entire movie, is this screen. Similarly, that's an important question. Vedanta does not violate science. Does not even try to falsify science. Look at the claims of science. What it might uh, contradict is the scientific worldview. Right now, 
It contradicts the religious worldview also. It contradicts the scientific worldview also. Scientific, yeah, for, sure. Yeah, for sure. Scientific worldview is that time, space, matter, energy, these are real. That's all that is real. Even your consciousness, religion, all of this, these are tiny byproducts in an insignificant little speck of dust called the earth. Um, there is a little like a bacterial infection on its surface called the human civilization, bound to last for a few thousand years only. In that they have imagined these silly philosophies bound to be wiped out when the sun goes nova. So uh, that's, that's the scientific worldview. There is no further reality to, to what you are saying other than this. The reality is stars and planets and particles, that's the reality. The only reality. There is no more fundamental reality than that. If you want fundamental reality in science, you can go to quarks, you can go to superstrings. That's as far as we have understood. So, what would Vedanta say to it? It would say yes to everything. Fine. Everything is fine. All of this is nothing other than pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is just a term we are using. By that we don't even mean the empirical consciousness found in the human brain. It means that existence consciousness in which this entire universe is experienced. Within it, science and religion and art and literature have full play. Full play. Um, Advaita does not falsify any of them. It says it's all on the level of Vyavaharika Satyam. It will work. And it is correct. Does Advaita um, prefer the, I don't know, the theories. There is... Uh, the particle theory and the superstring theory, I think, two models for physics or something. Advaita will say that we don't know. Science has to figure it out for itself. Yeah. It has no bearing at all on Advaita. There's a lot of discussion possible on this. For example, somebody said, see, in a, it's a principle in science that something that is not falsifiable cannot be true. A scientific Truth must be falsifiable. That means I put forward something, you must give me the, uh, the, an experiment which will show me that it's either false or true. You can show it is. But that's true of an object within the universe. It's not true of the ground of the universe. How would you falsify that? I mean, I'll give you an. Uh, yeah, I'm coming to you. It's, my question is related. Yes. To that. Yes. So in the wake of states, uh, I can tell that I had a dream. Yes. Yes. How, what is the concept of perception of real consciousness? There's no, no perception of real consciousness. Well, what, I, I know I'm trying to be careful with the language. Yes. So don't know what that is. Yes. What would you call that in the superconscious? Mm, see, the terms which we're using are right. not superconscious. It, it is consciousness itself. It, it is being. Remember one thing, this question about proof. You know, the Advaitins have considered this. Uh, the answer is very interesting. All things, we require proof for all things. A thing exists here, for example, a thing exists here in my hand, the book. What is the proof for this claim? The proof is that I see it. That's sufficient proof that I can see it. The source of knowledge is pratyaksha, seeing. And um, something like a scientific proof you know, about gravity or the, that light, um, uh, the propagation of light. There are scientific proofs which will operate based on instruments and you have got hypotheses, collect data and then it is proved. So, in, in Vedanta, these are called pramana, sources of knowledge. Pramana means source of knowledge. So, pratyaksha means um, percep direct perception is a pramana. Inference, anumana, that's a pramana. Anum inference is a pramana. Science, religion, they all depend on pramana. How do you know there is a heaven? How do you know there is a hell? They will say, because my scripture tells me so. That means for you the scripture is a pramana. If someone else does not accept that pramana, it will not be a pramana for him. So this is called the science of, the term, modern term for this is epistemology. How do you know? Justify your knowledge. Alright, this is as far as philosophy goes. Even science also has an epistemology of science. How do you justify your claims? Now, what Vedanta says here is very interesting. It says, all our justifications, all our efforts at knowledge, they all depend on this consciousness. 
It is this consciousness which deploys eyes and ears. It's this consciousness which deploys um, the intellect to make inferences. All your knowledge depends on this consciousness. It cannot be proved by an instrument of knowledge. I'll repeat it. All pramana in Sanskrit, pramana, prameya, vyavahara. All use of instruments of knowledge to know the objects of knowledge. They are all dependent on consciousness. It is consciousness alone which deploys them. They cannot prove consciousness because they are instruments in its hand. And I can accept that. Yes. The problem I'm having is, uh, so as I'm awake, I can tell that I had a dream. Yes. So I can, I'm going from one state to another. One. Let's just call them that. You're okay. referring, that, referring back to that. All right. Mm. If I'm dreaming, perhaps I can tell that I'm dreaming. But if I'm behind the screen, how hmm. do I tell, oh look, that was the oh, wake state or the dream life state. Yes, that is, so that is why, uh, if you go to, the first chapter was all about that. How do you discri uh, discriminate the background consciousness from all of this? Um, the, have you uh, listened to the talks of the first chapter? The, uh, no. Oh, you, you should. That was it. That was that was where this fourth consciousness, not the waking, not the dreaming, not the deep sleep, the background awareness. That, that's where it was introduced. And how to understand that? Uh, so that is the um, that is the beginning of Vedanta. That uh, how do you do that? You ask yourself the question: Who am I? What am I? Because Vedanta makes the claim that you are that consciousness. So if you start tracing what exactly am I, you will reach that. And I'm fine with that. I just want to know how do I know there is there, that from there to this. There is here. the one, I'll tell you this right now. The one which is aware of there and this, this and that, that is the pure consciousness. It, what's it, that what is that called? Yeah. You call it Brahman, call it Turiya, call it Chaitanya. I'll give you a whole list of names. What difference does it make? You must notice it within yourself straight away. I'm giving an answer to that. The answer is a pointer. The pointer is this. That to which this and there appear. This one, that one, both of them appear to what? You say to my eyes. But your eyes appear to what? Or to my mind. Your mind, thoughts, emotions appear to what? Clearly they appear. So this is the way to do it. Now let me just go on a little further. One more verse. So the problem is, yeah, we have just enough time to complete because this is connected. The problem is because of ignorance of the rope, you see it in wrong ways. What are the wrong ways? Snake, a stick on the ground, a discarded garland. These are the classic examples. Today we might say a computer cable or something like that has been thrown there, some, whatever. Now, what is the solution then? Exactly like that, the Atman itself is imagined as the universe. As what universe? As the waker and the waker's universe. As the dreamer and the dream universe. As the deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's darkness. What is imagined as this? The, you, the pure consciousness. This is the statement. Question was, where does the jiva come from? The answer is, where does the snake come from? From ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of the rope. Where does the jiva come from? From ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of your real nature as pure consciousness. Then what is to be done about it? Next. We'll do up to this one, 18th verse. Nishchitayam yatha rajvam Nishchitayam yatha rajvam Vikalpo vinivartate, Vikalpo vinivartate, Rajure veti cha dvaitam, Rajure veti cha dvaitam, Tadvad atma vinishchayaha, Tadvad atma vinishchayaha. Just as an illusion on the rope ceases and the rope alone remains, when the rope is ascertained to be nothing but the rope. So also is the ascertainment about the self. How? What is meant here? Moment you bring in light and show that, oh, it's a rope. What happens? Moment you realize it's a rope. First, you realize it's a rope. One. Second, all the errors are wiped out. Not one error, the next error, the third error. No, all errors disappear immediately. 
it's not a snake it's not a stick in the ground it's not a discarded garland all errors are immediately wiped out and you know it's a rope similarly when the atman is ascertained i am the underlying existence consciousness bliss then all the errors what is the error i am body and mind here is a physical universe that is wiped out atman alone exists now very very important this distinction remember rope snake is an example everything about the example will not apply what applies and what does not apply this is what you have to learn from a teacher uh, otherwise the um, uh, example can be misleading in the case of the rope snake when you bring in a light the very appearance of the snake disappears if you see it as a rope you don't even see the snake anymore and you realize it was a mistake there was no snake to begin with i saw it by mistake but in enlightenment when you realize you are satchidananda it does not mean that after enlightenment um the waking world will disappear and the waker will disappear the dreams will disappear and the dreamer will disappear no 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 the appearance the movie will continue you'll know it as a movie uh-huh. even after enlightenment when sri ramakrishna opens his eyes with the eyes he will see form he will see the kali temple of dakshineshwar with the ears he will hear the song of a uh, of uh, to divine mother ears will hear sound eyes will hear uh, will see sight and mind will think intellect will understand every function will continue you will only realize every bit of it is nothing other than i the pure consciousness that knowledge will be clear that clarity will come that's why he says look atma vinishchaya ascertainment clarity conviction uh, insight about the self atma self vinishchaya insight conviction clarity knowledge clear knowledge that comes it's not that the world will disappear in a flash so that this thing must be clearly understood otherwise it will lead to endless confusion when you look at the lives of enlightened people do they or do they not see the world they see the world in practical terms they see everything like we see do they hear sounds or not of course they do you ask a question he gives you an answer will he say that now i can't hear anymore too late i'm enlightened now <laughs> no everything will function as it is he realizes the truth about everything the truth is satchidananda existence consciousness place you thought it was real you um, you now know it's a movie the movie can continue what's the harm let the movie continue as a movie you have gone from lower truth thinking of the movie as real to the higher truth thinking of the movie as a movie you still get involved in the movie sometimes yes you will play a role because the the body and mind you have that's part of the movie right you are not the body and mind you are the awareness shining through the body and mind you will make the body and mind play its role the sadhu will remain as a sadhu the householder can remain as a householder the um, uh, academician can remain as an academician what's the problem you can play your role in the movie you are satchidanand you are free of the role anyway you will not say i'm stuck in it anymore you are free of it yeah yes isn't a uh, very good question if all is brahman isn't all real brahman is real all is brahman isn't all real then no. tell me it's a projection all right let me give you that thing or hold on to that but first of all let me give you the classical vedantic answer Brahman alone is real and all else the world is false the world is false brahman is real the world is false if all is brahman and then the and brahman is real doesn't all become real it's like saying remember the the definition of real which has existence of its own which exists by itself so brahman exists by itself so it is real it is existence itself but everything else all houses and cars and stars and particles do they exist by themselves or do they exist depending on brahman depending yes on brahman. depending on brahman use the dream experience in your dream all is my mind my mind is real so all is real in the dream no my mind alone is real from a waking perspective 
and this waking mind alone projects a dream. So everything in the dream, they are not real entities themselves, they are only the waking mind dreaming. So it is true that everything in the uh, dream is my mind. But there only the mind is real, everything is not real. So Swami Vivekananda, Mary Hale's poem, uh, she wrote to Vivekananda saying that, You have said all is God, I have understood your teaching. And Swami Vivekananda wrote back a poem saying that, I have never taught such strange doctrine that all is God. So you said it. So what I said, here is the answer to your question. I have said, only God is, all is not. All is an appearance of God. If I say screen alone is real. But the screen alone is appearing as Harry Potter and the school and everything. So Harry Potter is also real? No. Harry Potter is an appearance on the screen. The reality of, follow this, the reality of Harry Potter is the screen and the light, which is making Harry Potter appear. Similarly, the reality of this world is Brahman. This world is not real in itself. Now, one more point here. Ramana Maharshi asked this question once. Very interesting. He says, who can call this world real? We normally think it's the ordinary ignorant person who calls the world real. He says, no. Only the enlightened person can truly call this world real. It's the enlightened person who sees Brahman. Who sees means experiences, knows the truth about Brahman. Knows the truth about the absolute. That person alone knows the real. And knows that the real alone is appearing as the world. So that person knows the reality of the world. Not anybody else. We live in a dream world. We live in a dream world. So he says only the enlightened person can truly call the world is real. Now, Sri Ramakrishna, the gospel, very interesting question. Somebody asked him, is the world false? And his answer is very interesting. He says, oh no, why should it be false? It is a step in the process of reasoning. In Bengali, mitta kana hobe go, o bicharer katha. What he means is, it is a part in the process to realization. You make a division. False world, real Brahman. Then appreciate real Brahman. Then you see real Brahman is everything, including so, the so-called, there is no such thing as a false world. Brahman alone is everything. But if you start with that, what will happen is, Brahman alone is everything. So you say, okay, this is the world I know. People and houses and cars and happiness and misery. So this is the uh, ultimate reality. You will be stuck there. Right. All right. So he says, the ascertainment, just as when the rope is ascertained to be the rope, the rope alone remains and all the illusions, whether snake, whether twig or um, the um, cable, computer cable <laughs> or a discarded garland. Another thing they use is jaladhara, a trickle of water on the ground, they use that. So those things are immediately negated. Uh, you realize it's a rope. Similarly, the world continues to appear. You will continue to have a body. Your mind will continue with its old tendencies. After enlightenment also, Sri Ramakrishna liked Jalebi. <laughs> you, if you have a particular tendency, you, that will continue. Because that's a characteristic of your mind. That's a part of the movie. The movie is not disturbed by realizing that it's a movie. Science is part of the movie. When you realize that it's a movie, will the science in the movie change? No. It's still there. It's exactly as it, it, it continues. Only the scientific worldview at present seems to point towards a reductionist materialist worldview. This is what uh, is challenged by this world. It's a different worldview altogether. Uh, we are having this discussion with Bill. If you could, if you could explain consciousness, if and he says, just wait, it will, science will explain consciousness very soon. <laughs> but if you could actually explain consciousness in depth, then this would be falsified. How are we getting first person experiences? Okay. A simple question I was asking the doctor here. That when I have a blood test, the doctor does not ask me about the iron content in my blood. He knows much better. Even if I ask him, what I say will be of no use to him. His, his scanning and everything will reveal everything to him much better than I know. It's an objective truth, about which I really, the jiva here has no idea really. But when you are searching for consciousness, and you prick this finger, and you scan the brain, and a particular neuron fires, 
and you say, do you feel a pain? Where, in which finger do you feel a pain? If scientific instruments could reveal everything, it can reveal the firings of neurons in my brain. Why doesn't it reveal the pain also? Why do you have to ask me? Mm -hmm. And how did they find uh, the anesthesia for, you know, the person who had anesthesia? They found consciousness. How did they... That's a new paper which has come recently that in anesthesia also consciousness actually continues but what it does is it wipes out the memory of uh, uh, the conscious experience. So you feel you have come out of nothingness, blankness. Which is why a doctor told me that particular kind of anesthesia, uh, they told me the name, that one doctors who know how it works they don't want to go into that. Uh, you will actually experience all the pain of the operation, while it's being operated, and you are helpless under it. Except when you come out, it'll be wiped out, the memory will be wiped out. <laughs> so, the doctors, it's a particular kind of anesthesia. Now, don't resist anesthesia next time you go to the hospital. It's only a particular kind of anesthesia. Uh, anyway, um, I'll just conclude with one thing. That's why I bought the big book. Very interesting. This last verse, it concluded with a term. When the nature of the self is ascertained. Vinishchita means ascertaining. Now, here you have Shankaracharya's commentary on this. Just to demonstrate what you can do with Sanskrit. There's a word, ascertainment. And what Shankaracharya comments about that word, ascertainment. He strings together 13 terms into one word. But to show what, what is meant by ascertaining the nature of the self, by becoming aware of who we are, basically enlightenment. So what does he say here? Sarva samsara dharma shunya pratipadaka shastra janita vijnana surya loka krita atma vinishchaya. What does it? It's one word in, in Sanskrit. <laughs> Technically it's one word. It can be treated as a single word. What does it mean if you translate into English? It is the ascertainment achieved by the blazing, by the, by the, uh, by, by the blazing illu light like sunlight, which is the knowledge produced by Vedanta um, about the self, which is free of all the qualities of samsara. This is the meaning of one word. Sarva samsara. Of all samsara, dharma shunya, qua, uh, characteristics of sam samsara, sukha, dukkha, happiness, misery, desire, frustration, devoid of all of that. How is the, the, the self, how is it known? Shastra janita, Vedanta, the knowledge which is produced by this Vedantic uh, investigation. And pratipadaka, uh, uh, the Vedanta which talks about the self, pratipadaka which explains the self. And what's it, this knowledge like? Is it something intellectual? Is it something vague? He says, Surya Aloka Krita. Like, like being illumined by the blazing light of the sun. It becomes so clear. So I'll end again. I began with the words of Sri Ramakrishna. And I'll end with the words of Sri Ramakrishna. He says to Keshav Sen, You have traveled far and wide and seen so much of different distant lands. Have you not seen my mother who holds all of this together? He calls it mother, and this is what we call uh, pure consciousness or Brahman. All right. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu.